I'm Jenny Carlson. I'm Barry Trammell. Welcome to the Jenny and Barry Show. Chet Holmgren is having a monster season, and it'd be a monster season regardless of where he was in his career. But as a rookie, he's doing things either rarely or never done before. Has he sewn up the rookie of the year? If not, could Thursday's game against the Spurs and Victor Wimbanyama be a determining factor? We'll talk about all that and more. But first, we want to say thanks to these sponsors for supporting the Jenny and Barry Show. The Oklahoma Ford Dealers Association, Mid First Bank, Next Gen Roofing, Two Fellows Movers, the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, 988, Oklahoma's Mental Health Lifeline. Drive into your best in Oklahoma Ford dealers today for the best deals on Ford's full lineup of trucks and SUVs. Ford is the best in Oklahoma. And let's face it, a box of pizza and a case of beer just don't work like they used to. Nobody wants to help you move. But we know two fellas who love moving. At Two Fellas Moving Company, we offer free, no strings quotes for your move. With more than 20 years experience, we've pretty much moved it all. Our services don't end up moving either. Need to do some remodeling or spring cleaning? We've got you covered with dumpster rentals and junk haul services. Remember, quotes are free and there are no strings attached. If you're moving in Oklahoma, make sure to call the fellas. Visit twofellas.com for your free quote today. All right, Barry, Chet Holmgren, he's a, if it wasn't for Shea Gilgis-Alexander and Jalen Williams and some other guys on the Thunder, we'd just be talking about Chet Holmgren because, man, does he have some moments where he just explodes. We saw it on Sunday against Houston in that fourth quarter. My goodness, what a performance by Chet Holmgren. Well, he, you know, Chet is just uh, turning into a dream draft pick, everything you could want and more. From a from a rookie, now he's a second year rookie, of course. But you know, we we talked in the off season, uh, the previous off season, both we talked about: is this a guy uh, that could be an offensive superstar? Could he be a defensive superstar? He's a two track prospect, and the truth is, he is he's just worked out famously on both tracks. He's a defensive de- de- uh, defensive difference maker, and he's an offensive plus in any kind of way you can measure. And what I like about him is he's getting more rough and tumble the longer the season goes. So the the Chet Holmgren odyssey is off to a fabulous start for the Thunder. Yeah, he uh, has already reached 100 blocks and 103 pointers, which no rookie, Barry, has ever done before. Now there's a good chance he gets joined by one Victor Wimbanyama before this is over because Wimby already has over 100 blocks and I think he's got 80 plus uh, threes at this point as we sit here on Monday afternoon, but uh, likely to get to 100 and 100. But just, Barry, I, I got to admit, Sunday night uh, with the earlier tip time at, at the peak, I'm sorry, at the peak, at the Paycom Center, I'm getting in the way back machine here for a second. I, uh, I had uh, some other stuff going on. So I had most of that game against the Rockets on the radio. And I the, the fourth quarter gets started and I literally thought that there was a glitch in the radio broadcast because of how many times I kept hearing Chet Holmgren had hit another bucket. I thought, wait, this can't be possible. At this point, he's got to have 12 or 14 points. That was the case. He just went off the hook to start that fourth quarter against the Rockets. Well, let me ask you. That's actually something I hardly ever do is listen to the Thunder on the radio. How was Matt Pinto's call? for that for that uh fourth quarter spurt it was pretty excited as you might expect i mean most people would be if even if that's not your team to watch a guy uh, get started like that it was crazy barry yeah you know i I think it was 19 points in the first whatever it was eight minutes of the fourth quarter something like that anyway he didn't have to play at the end because they had him so blown out that's right holmgren's his numbers have gotten really good again he's up to He's up to 40.3% on three-pointers, 54.4% all told. He's he's an analytic analytic dream. Um, You know, three-pointers and dunks, that's what he mostly mostly does. And um, his shot wavered earlier in the year. It's come back strong inside. He's finishing much better. You know, when you're 7-1, you don't have as much – much of a, a journey to the top of the rim, and he's he's uh, getting it done. So yeah, it was uh, it was a stunning performance. I thought that game in Houston was a 
Uh, Thunder wasn't playing well for two and a half quarters, sort of got in gear. Took a, a small lead going into the fourth, and you wonder what. Well, they, you know, that's always a little bit of a dicey thing. Santa Clara Williams can take over with SGA on the bench, but he didn't have to in Houston. Uh, Chet Holmgren took over and uh, really showed, I think, that the Thunder is a, th- a three-headed monster. And lots of, lots of teams shoot for the three stars. Uh, Thunder was hoping it could get to two. All of a sudden, uh, blink an eye, and they're at three. So Holmgren, Jalen Williams from Santa Clara, and Shea Gilgis-Alexander, quite the trio. Yeah, and I think what you said earlier, the thing about those three, and now that we're seeing how Chet's evolving, is that they are truly two-way stars. I mean, all three of those guys are so good on both ends of the court. And we knew that Chet Holmgren was likely to be a defensive um, difference maker. We didn't, I don't know if anybody suspected he'd be to the level he is now, but you know, I don't know about you, Barry, but I thought, well, as good as he is defensively, maybe that, you know, maybe he just has to take a step back on the offensive end. And we'll talk about this in a second, but there was a time earlier this year when I think everybody thought, has he hit a wall? Is he going to be able to get over it as a rookie? But he's really superiorly talented and able to do both, which to me is a whole other thing. It's one thing to have the skill, but it's another thing to have the energy and the ability to be really good on both ends. And right now he's really good on both ends. He is. He's a, um, he's better on defense than I thought he would be. Mm. Uh, We worried about him. Stronger. He's, he is stronger. We worried about him maybe being out on the perimeter a little bit, but uh, Mark Dagnalt does a great job of, of limiting those exposures. But when he is, he sort of hangs in there. He can block from behind. He's very active. That's what I like is he's not a, he's not a stationary guy. Uh, and, and so I, I think his defense probably still is a little ahead of his offense, but that offense is very good. So my only really complaint about Chet is sometimes he puts the ball on the ground. I mean, uh, you know, on the floor too much, a little too much dribbling, but then he'll, you know, he'll go coast to coast, take it and either score or, or dish. So he's just a, he's just a phenomenal talent. And I credit Dagnalt and that coaching staff for sort of making it all, uh, all work here as a, as a, uh, freshman. It's not, a freshman as a as a rookie he has a he has a uh a certain uh toughness that means hey he's he's gonna take he's gonna take a rough night and and get going and he doesn't have to score 29 points doesn't have to score 26 points that clipper game to uh earlier last week uh i thought he was sensational in, against the clippers i think he scored 17 so he it wasn't an explosive but he can show that he's he's a big time winner even when he's not putting up huge numbers. Yeah, and you know, the the sort of only blip is that wall, which could be a freshman wall if you want it, rookie wall, whatever uh, level we're going to talk about here. You know, there was sort of some concern there for a while. I think it was, uh, you know, maybe a month or so ago. It was a tough month of uh, January for the Thunder. Uh, it almost seems like a lifetime ago that we were you know, worried, quote unquote, you know, was this, had we sort of seen the best days of Chet Holmgren this season? Were they now behind us? Again, that seems long ago and far away. I think we can safely say that there's no more rookie wall that Chet Holmgren is hitting. No, it doesn't look, it looks like he's ready for the stretch run. It looks like he's, he's primed for a playoff push. Now, when we get to the playoffs, we'll see if, if something's different, but no, he's been spectacular. You know, really, the only question for the regular season about Chet Holmgren is, is he going to win Rookie of the Year? First couple of months of the season, it looked like he would win it. Uh, Victor Wimbenyama uh, got off to a little slow start. Holmgren looked better. Last couple of months, Wimbenyama has come up and doing amazing things. Uh, I would say that Victor Wimbenyama probably has has stolen the favorites role out of out of uh, Chet Holmgren's grasp, but I, I still think it's a horse race. What do you think? Is is Chet or Wimby going to win Rookie of the Year? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I just want to say I'm really proud of you for saying Wimby and Yama four times in a row there mm. without any problem. That was very good, Barry. Yeah, I, I can spell it even better. I learned to spell it. That's, that's one thing I did last, was it last summer? I, 
I spent like 10 minutes really concentrating and saying, I'm going to be typing this guy's name for the next 15 years. I'm going to learn how to, I'm going to learn how to spell this thing. So, um, uh, I did the same thing with, uh, Giannis. Uh, I still can't say his last name correctly, <laughs> Antetokounmpo, but I can spell it. I can just spell it right off the top of my head. See, and I've got Antetokounmpo figured out, but I can't spell it for, for the life of me. So good thing Giannis goes by a first name. I can just stick with that sometimes. The, the rookie of the year question, though, is going to be fascinating because here's the thing. What you said earlier about Chet and his analytic, uh, you know, how much a, of an analytic type player, he just stuffs the analytics. And we've talked about these voters before, Barry, for these awards, whether it's MVP, all NBA, um, rookie of the year, coach of the year. They're a very educated voting block. I mean, a lot of these folks, they just, you know, sink their teeth into the deepest recesses of all of these numbers and these analytics. And listen, there's no doubt that that Victor Wembanyama's numbers are going to be juicy as well. I think the question is going to become, what do voters value more? Do they value a guy on a team that's pushing for the playoffs or a guy on a team that isn't winning very much, that's basically in another uh, hunt for another uh, lottery pick? And I don't know what the answer is to that because I think you're going to see you know, fairly comparable numbers when all is said and done. Um, it might be that Chet's overall averages are a little lower because he is playing with two other outstanding players. So, of course, they're not going to be maybe as gigantic as if he is by himself as a star as Wimby is in San Antonio. So I think that's going to, there's just going to have to be some things that voters are going to weigh. And I don't know what the answer is, but, you know, I know Wimbin Yama has been a, a popular pick basically since he decided that he was coming. Uh, you know, people have probably had him penciled in as rookie of the year for the first year he'd be in the league regardless. But I think those voters are going to have a lot of decisions to make when it comes to these two. Yeah, and I think it really comes down to this if you're a voter. Um, if you just go by, by raw impact, uh, you probably go with Wimbin Yama because He's an unbelievably uh, different kind of player. We've never seen the likes of somebody that long-armed and that uh, that much ability to alter shots and to to uh, recover on uh, on defense and 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 come from by way behind and block shots, following you in the lane. I mean, it's like you know you're running through the street at night in a dark alley and you don't know what's behind you, but you know something is. Right. So uh, just just the wow factor is probably Victor Wimbanyama. But what yeah. you have to counter is Victor Wimbanyama and the Spurs. It's a total rebuild. One of the worst teams in the NBA. Victor Wimbanyama has played in exactly zero important games for San Antonio. Yeah. And Chad Holmgren is in the middle of a pennant race. I mean, the Thunder's tied. Uh, as, as we tape this, they're tied for first in the Western Conference. And every game that Chet Holmgren has played and every game down the stretch is, is a meaningful game. It's a high-tension game. It's a high-profile game. Uh, that's only going to increase as we march toward the playoffs. So uh, do you factor that in more? If you do, if you do give Holmgren a lot of credit for playing more important games, affecting winning more, then he's got a shot. If not, it'll be victor. Yeah, it, it's going to be an interesting debate. And I, you know, they've got a lot of voters. So, you know, you've got a lot of different opinions and what you think is important. Um, uh, quick question, Barry. Where, have you been, you've been in the house when Victor Wimbanyama has been on the floor, right? You've been, you've been in the arena this yeah, year. Yeah. He's, he's something. It, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, it's very striking. It, <laughs> that's a good I word for that. it. He's one of those guys. This happened to me two or three times in covering the NBA, Jacko. Who, okay, who are your guys? Because I've got mine. Okay. Uh, number one on the list are the guys that you just can't, you can't not stare. Uh, Yao Ming is number one. Totally. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, he's got tree trunks for legs and he's seven foot be five, seven, five. Unbelievable. This, the yeah. thing that got me is, is at uh, one of the all-star games, maybe in Houston, I think maybe. Yao Ming passed Shaq in the tunnel. And Yao Ming 
made Shaq look small. So that's where I said, whoa, this is, <laughs> this is something strange. This is something strange. Who you got? Who else you got? The, the other guy that sticks out in my mind, and I have to think in retrospect, he wasn't as, I mean, he's definitely no Yao Ming in that regard. But the first year that the Hornets were in town, Kevin Garnett was still playing. And yeah. he definitely not as big as Yao, not as wide as Shaq. I mean, all of those things. But at the time, I seem to remember that the media still had some courtside seats. And we were actually, for whatever reason, I think I was on the baseline for that game. And I just had this thought in my head. If Kevin Garnett falls over, he's going to take out like three rows of people, which yep. is not going to happen. But in your head, this guy, you, mean, you know how big he is. And then to see him in person the first time, it was just an outsized reaction that, you know, I know it wasn't realistic, but it, it, th that was a big guy too. But I do think the whole, just the body construction of, Wim, uh, of Victor Wimbanyama, the arms and the legs and just everything looks like it's not possible. Like that's the thing that as I, I looked at him the, the first time in person, it's just like, how is this, how is this human being even possible that he could have these body parts all, you know, connected and working together. And it just felt, it felt impossible. So he, even as, even as unique a player as Chad Holmgren is, as a lot of players are in the NBA, the body type of Wick, Victor Wimbanyama to me is, I mean, it's, it's totally something I've never seen before. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's just crazy. I mean, we've seen guys that tall. I don't know that we've seen guys who could move like he moves that tall yeah. and those arms look like something out of Marvel comics. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he's, he's something else. The one other guy I would add on my list of, uh, physically imposing, uh, impressive looking guys was Rashid Wallace, who I always thought of as an NBA power forward, uh, North Carolina. So I'm in college at North Carolina, then in the NBA, primarily with the Pistons. But I saw Rashid Wallace live at when the Hornets were here. And he is every bit of seven foot. I mean, he was a giant among men who was playing rough and tumble basketball out on the court like he's a, you know, six, seven power forward who just sc scrapes around and gets things done. Very physically imposing. But, but Victor, uh, Victor Wimbanyama is. Uh, he's something else. And, uh, you know, when, when he and Holmgren have played this year, it's not been great. Um, I think both had a poor game, and then uh, both of them had a pretty good game. But um, it's, this is going to be a battle royale for the, for the uh, next decade or so. I'm really looking forward to following this one-on-one this -on -one, one -on -one duel between Chet Holmgren and Victor Wimbanyama. Yeah, and you know, Thursday night's game between the two teams, I don't think it maybe decides rookie of the year, but I definitely think it's one of those things that voters get to see these guys on the same court, you know? And if one of them does something, uh, you know, I don't know, if if Victor drops 40, even if it's not the two guarding each other, which if you've watched these matchups, there's not a ton of them guarding to each other. It's not like it's a one-on-one -on -one matchup within the game most of the time. But a big statistical night a bunch of blocks or something like that, that might give one of these guys a little hedge in the minds of some voters. I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't know. But that's the one thing I will say. I don't think this game decides Rookie of the Year, but it could just be another, you know, sort of tick mark in, the, in a box for one of these guys if they happen to have a big night. But I think as it relates to Chet Holmgren, Barry, I mean, if we want to talk upside, if we want to talk things that still remain to be seen, I mean, there's so much about Holmgren at this point when you, try, when you think about upside. I mean, you mentioned it before. We thought we knew what kind of player this guy could be. We thought we knew he was pretty spectacular in some regards. But the upside, it's changed this season. We even see more upside, I think, in this guy now. Yeah, and what we're seeing more, more to his game, um, we're seeing him uh, pass the ball, not bad. Um, we're seeing him make fewer turnovers in the open court. We are seeing him um, not get down when he has a – maybe my most favorite thing about Chad Holmgren's progression, progression this year is uh, uh, 
sort of a slow start, a weak first quarter, does not mean he stays that way for the whole game. I mean, he can still affect the game in other ways. His shot will come. He's very confident. He's, uh, you know, he's the total package. He seems like uh, he's really integrated himself in with the uh, with the squad. He's one of the guys they, you know, it, it's it's uh, the reincarnation of Thunder U, and um, just just an unbelievable draft pick, unbelievable player, uh, star already, future superstar almost certainly. Yeah, and you know it was interesting watching uh, watching the two teams, uh, the Thunder and the Rockets, run around down in Houston on Sunday. I was reminded Jabari Smith is the guy that you know. I yeah. know I said I thought that they should take Jabari Smith, and he may still very well have a great career. I mean, I don't know. He's still young. He's still you know got some athleticism and talent, obviously. But at this point, you know, you would have obviously said I was a big fool for thinking that Jabari Smith was the guy that they should take over Chad Holmgren because it's everything that you said. Plus, I love the idea that Chad Holmgren, he sometimes uh, has some games. I mean, you mentioned the Clippers game where he was so good defensively, really was the anchor of a fantastic defensive performance. Maybe he didn't have the offensive night, but he doesn't let one affect the other. If he's needed uh, to score, you know, it's not like his defense hits the hits the downward trend and, and vice versa. So to me, that's one more plus in his uh, in, in his, you know, upside. When you talk about downside, I mean, to me, there's very few obvious downsides. He's still slight, which you would like him to get a little bit bigger, I think, um, you know, just to sort of protect him and give him a chance to not be uh, you know, potential target to get injured. Uh, you know, that's an unknown at this point too. injured for a year. Now he's got almost a full year behind him, but we don't know about injuries and, and those sorts of things. So he's looked more resilient to me, Barry, than I thought he would have, uh, uh, physically. But I think, you know, when you're talking downside, I don't see a ton, but I would still like to see him add a few more pounds to his frame. Yeah. And uh, you know, you wonder how much he will add you look at a guy like Kevin Durant, he's gotten a lot stronger over his 15 years in the NBA. Um, is that right? So 18, like 16, 16 years in the NBA for Kevin Durant. But he Durant. hasn't gotten a lot bigger. He hasn't gotten a lot bigger. He hasn't gotten a lot stouter, but he is stronger. And that might be what we see with Chet Holmgren. Um, you don't want him to become Dwight Howard or some muscle man. You you need that skill to, to continue to break through. So. Um, but here's what's great about Holmgren. Holmgren, he's, you know, he's, he's, home, he's going to be a homegrown superstar. He's going to give the Thunder exactly what they want. He's going to be a, a defensive difference maker protecting the rim. And then he's going to be able to, to team with SGA and Santa Clara and, and deliver all kinds of offensive surplus. So, I mean, just a, just a, a draft pick that just came together. You mentioned Jabari Smith. Uh, Bancaro, Paolo Bancaro is the number one pick in that draft. Orlando went with Bancaro, excellent player, doing a great job, made the all-star team. Thunder gets Holmgren at two. Houston gets Jabari Smith at three. I think Jabari Smith's going to be really good. But Chad Holmgren was the perfect fit for the Thunder. Yeah, sort of the one unanswered question at this point about Chad Holmgren, what about the playoffs? And we're going to get to find out because the Thunder is going. We're going to get to see him in postseason. But how do you think he translates, Barry? What, what do you like? What are you maybe more concerned about as it relates to the playoffs with Chet Holmgren? I think it's possible that Holmgren is um, a little less effective because, uh, you know, the, often defenses clamp down in the in postseason. It becomes more one-on-one -on -one basketball. It's going to be... Uh, not a lot of one on one for Holmgren. Now he can still do the catch and shoot threes because, you know, the the drives of Santa Clara or the drives of SGA can can lead to open threes. Uh, Holmgren's pretty good in the uh, in the uh, open court. You'll see less open court basketball, but I think Holmgren will be. Um, I think he'll be fine in the playoffs, but I, he might be a little less effective just from style of play. Yeah, and I do think the one thing that he has that's a positive for the playoffs is the way that he 
learns and grows from one exposure to a team, to a player, um, to the next. You know, we've seen it over the course of this year, whether it, you know, Denver is probably the best example, but, you know, really struggles early in the year with Denver, with Jokic. Next time around, handles him much better. Third time around, handles him even better. I mean, it just seems like his his book of knowledge and his adjustment and the ability to do that is really, really good. So in playoff series, when you're seeing the same teams again and again and again, the the ability to tweak, to adjust, to find little differences, little advantages, that's going to be really interesting to see how Chet Holmgren you know, mentally adjusts how that affects what he can do out there. I agree. It's not, he's not really a one-on-one type of player in the vein of SGA or Jalen Williams, but I still think it's going to be really interesting to see what he does in the playoffs. Um, because I think again, he's got great ability, great combination of ability. And then some of those, uh, you know, the, the mental things that he brings to the table. It's going to be fascinating to see how it all plays out. Well, that's all the time we've got this week. We've got all sorts of Thunder content at selloutcrowd.com, so you can find our columns, videos, and podcasts there as well as barrytrammell.com and jenny-carlson.com. If you want our content sent straight to your inbox, sign up for our newsletters. It's free and it's easy. Just head to the selloutcrowd.com website and opt in. If this happens to be your first time hearing or watching us, be sure to subscribe to our show on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And if you like what you hear, please leave us a review. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.